It's been really inspiring to see the kind of movements that are being bridged in terms of the environmental justice movement. Um, so for example, the legal challenges that are being uh, mounted uh, against the federal government for tar sands development, as well as legal challenges against FIPA. Um, so we had a number of First Nations who were challenging FIPA, and you saw um, many people from different movements, uh, youth movements, groups like Lead Now, who were supporting um, that legal challenge. Um, we see movements coming together, for example, around the Beaver Lake uh, Cree Nation legal case um, to tar sand, challenge to tar sands development, challenge against the federal government. Um, so in my experience, um, that looked like this group I was working with, Shit Harper, did. Um, a lot of young people and a lot of artists um, coming together with people active in the indigenous rights movement coming together to fundraise for a legal challenge um, against tar sands developments on Beaver Lake Cree, Na Cree land that were unconstitutional. And so how does that happen? Um, and that fundraiser, um, I would encourage you to check it out, go to the thetarsandstrial.com. Um, and we know that First Nations legal challenges are in of themselves inherently important um, for supporting Indigenous rights. And they're also important in terms of stopping climate change. Um, they're some of our best hope for um, stopping environmental destruction. And so I, this was an incredible uh, coming together of people. And how does this sort of coming together happen from unexpected movements? And I think oftentimes it takes a connector. It takes a few people who are sort of living in both worlds. Um, say in the world of the indigenous rights movement and say in the world of youth movements. Um, and oftentimes it comes down to friendship. And that's really how, in my experience, movements are bridged. It's one or two people who know each other and who meet each other, have a connection, get connected, and then introduce each other's friends. Um, at its most basic, I think that's what it comes down to. Welcome, Clayton. <laughs> All right. How are you? Good to see you. So that is one example. Another example um, that many of you are probably familiar with is around the Healing Walk. Um, we saw many people from diverse movements um, coming together. Um, people from the environmental justice movement, from the indigenous rights movement. Um, and we're, we're seeing that also in BC in terms of the movement against Enbridge. Uh, we see environmental and indigenous rights movements coming together. And where does that start? Sometimes that starts from friendship. Um, think of someone like Reuben George, um, who invited many people um, to take part in sweats and to um, build friendships, essentially, and then to also be active in struggle together. Um, so going out, very frequent, rallies happening. There's the Defend Our Climate, uh, Defend Our Coast rallies that happened um, that brought together uh, many different movements, indigenous rights movement, environmental movement. Um, and it's been incredibly inspiring to see that. Um, we also started to see, though I think this is one area where there is much more work to be done, um, in terms of the power shifts, um, the youth convergences. We saw young people, student movements, coming together with different movements um, from the migrant justice movement, um, from the indigenous rights movement. And I think these are spaces um, where we can come together, we can meet each other, and we can build those friendships. Because again, I think at the core of movement building and bridging movements is friends and its connectors. In terms of where we think we could build some more bridges, I think there's also a lot of work to be done. Um, 
One of those is in terms of environmental groups and labor organizing. Um, we see that in terms of building a future of climate justice and actually building green jobs, um, what could that look like? And it's, it's interesting, in BC, there is a green jobs organizer. That's their position, is organizing for green jobs. And if we are truly going to build, to stop pipelines and to build green jobs, this can be a really exciting opportunity um, for that kind of action. And so to think about what if we had green jobs organizers in many different regions um, who were working towards building um, those alternatives um, that we seek. Uh, in terms of bridging uh, labor and environmental groups as well, we see that the CCPA has done some really great studies on um, things like green jobs, but that those need to be uh, implemented and those need to be, um, those studies need to become a reality. And I think that that might be one way that we can move towards that. In terms of movements that are resisting Harper, um, there have been some bridges that have come together, um, people who have come together to resist Harper. Um, we've seen rallies, um, we've seen different um, occupations. Uh, I was recently in Quebec and I really liked uh, something that I saw there. People were gathering on the 19th of every month um, for 19 minutes to rally against the Harper government. And I think this is a really great idea and something that could certainly um, be taken up in different areas. Uh, very simple action, um, but definitely something we can do to keep the pressure on until the next federal election. And we know that our movements and our goals go beyond uh, just getting Harper out of power um, towards confronting uh, systems of oppression. And it's been also really interesting to see movements being bridged um, against colonization, against colonialism. Um, we've seen for example, um, with the Chilcotin uh, recently, a uh, huge victory um, led by the Chilcotin uh, for the recognition of their rights and title, as well as um, stopping the federal decision to stop the mine on their territory. That was very much led by the Chilcotin, and they also brought in um, supporters um, people to act in solidarity, um, community members. So you definitely saw some bridging of movements there. And I think that that's a really inspiring uh, story to, to learn towards and to build towards. I think that on the area of supporting these First Nations legal challenges and uh, First Nations rights cases, there's a lot of synergies and convergences uh, that can be built and ways that people can support that. And so I think when we are looking at how we can build together, um, there's, there are many different pockets of organizing that's happening um, and we also see how student movements um, are leading the charge in many ways um, against the tuition fee hikes and so that's an opening for other movements to join in in solidarity with that. Of course, gatherings like this one are a great uh, place to start, to actually come together, to meet each other face to face, to learn about each other, and to find those people who are connectors so that they can begin to bridge our different movements. So I will leave it at that for now, and I look forward to uh, further discussion. Hi everyone, thank you for being here. Um, it's a bit nippy up here. I don't know if it's a bit windy down there too. I presume it is. So we'll try, no, no, it's okay. I was gonna say, so we'll try to wrap this up maybe a bit sooner if folks are feeling a bit chilly. 
Um, I just want to thank the panelists and also folks for hosting this conversation. I want to start by acknowledging we're on unceded, unsurrendered Indigenous lands and give thanks to the host territories here. I live in Vancouver, which is unceded Coast Salish territories, lands of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and Squamish people. Um, and i am been on Turtle Island for about uh, 10 years. Um, in terms of uh, this issue or this conversation around bridging movements, I find it to be a really important one and, and a really exciting one. So I'm, I'm glad there's some interest in having this conversation. Um, I think for many of us who are from the global justice movement um, or even movements prior to that, there's a sense that that level of unity and coalescing hasn't really happened over the past decade um, in the ways that it did, and it, particularly in the sustained ways that it uh, was taking place during moments of Seattle, WTO, Quebec City, et cetera. Um, and so I think there's a need to reflect on why that might be, uh, and not in any way to romanticize the global justice movement, but to think through what are some of the failures that perhaps led to the lack of unity, and what are some of the, the lessons um, from that movement in particular. So in the current context, I think, you know, Brigitte pointed to some examples where there have been moments of, of movement solidarity. But I would suggest that in general, most of our movements right now um, largely operate kind of under a single issue framework, right? Which is that folks are working on um, environmental justice, folks are working on labor issues, uh, queer issues, women rights issues, migrant justice issues, indigenous sovereignty, etc. But largely people operate um, under the single issue framework. And there's, there's several reasons for that. There's obviously um, really important reasons, which is that when folks are doing really local grounded work, it becomes, it becomes harder to reach out for, for support and solidarity, particularly for those of us who organize in communities that are in survival mode. It becomes really hard to leave that and just go out and constantly be bridging and bringing people in, right? So capacity and being in survival mode is, is a really real issue. But I think there's also um, the, another dynamic at play, which is the fact that a lot of movements have become institutionalized and talk about issues separate from the root causes that create those issues, right? So um, largely within the environmental justice movement or particularly the climate movement, for, as an example, there isn't necessarily a whole lot of conversation about the root causes of environmental degradation in terms of the relationship of that to colonialism and capitalism and oppression, right? And if, I'm not suggesting that that conversation isn't happening, but particularly in the mainstream movement, it's not. And so the, the focus on single issues devoid from an analysis, a root cause analysis, is partly what I would suggest creates the silo effect because we don't see the ways in which our struggles are inter interconnected because we don't necessarily talk, to, talk about or, um, or analyze the systems that are at play. Um, there are, of course, some really clear examples that, that go against what I'm suggesting, right? So the Quebec student strike, for example, went beyond just talking about student debt as a single issue to talking about capitalism. And that led to the ability to bridge across different movements, to make connections to Plan North and the impact on Indigenous sovereignty, the impact on climate justice. There was conversations about um, racism in relationship to student debt and how that related to international students and migrant students and racialized students. Um, and so those kinds of conversations about capitalism and neoliberalism as a much deeper root issue rather than talking about student debt or tuition hikes was able to create a conversation that allowed various movements to connect to the Quebec student movement and for it to grow. Um, I don't know more is another clear example of that as well, right? Where a lot of movements lent support for Idle No More, um, because Idle No More is, is an incredibly dignified indigenous-led movement, was talking about colonialism as a root issue, talking about the bills that Harper had passed, but also talking about the long history of settler colonialism of Canada. Um, and that reality which underpins every single social movement, right? When we're talking about anti-poverty movements, whether we're talking about violence against, uh, violence against women, all of those issues are most deeply felt by indigenous communities. The high rates of, of uh, missing and murder murdered indigenous women is a key issue for the women's rights movement. Um, the deliberate impoverishment of indigenous communities as a result of dispossession and genocide is a key issue for anti-poverty activists and, and should be. And so, you know, those are two examples of movements that by articulating uh, a much more systemic analysis around colonialism and capitalism, we're actually able to bring more people in. And I think that's an important lesson. And again, this is, I think, and also an important lesson from the global justice movement, because a lot of times there's a lot of fear about talking about root issues. A lot of campaigns that are single issue campaigns worry that talking about capitalism or colonialism or oppression will actually lead to people being um, much more alienated, right? Because there's this myth of like, 
the average Joe person that we're trying to appeal to in our movements. Um, and I think that kind of strategic an analysis that people make around campaigning, I think is a mistake. I think that it's a, I think it's an ethical mistake because it's important to talk about capitalism and colonialism and how it impacts certain communities more than others. But I also think it's a strategic mistake because we can see that movements that actually inspire people, movements that bring thousands and tens of thousands and millions of people out on the street, locally, um, nationally, and also globally, are movements that talk about capitalism and colonialism and put those issues at the forefront. And so... I think it's important to keep that in mind. Um, and another example I want to point to is the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment, sanction campaigns against Israel. So for a long time, there's been a debate in the, in the Palestinian solidarity movement about what kind of approach to take when talking about Israel, right? Whether it's just anti-occupation, um, and there was a lot of fear that talking about Israeli apartheid would somehow alienate people. But the fact that the BDS movement, which has clear demands, including the right of return um, and the right, and talking about Palestine in terms of 1948 Palestine, and talking about BDS in very clear terms, and talking about Israel as a settler colonial apartheid state, has actually led to massive victories all around the world. And so it's really important, as another example, to point to the fact that it's important to always be consistent and not be afraid of talking about um, injustice in terms of the root causes of injustice and realizing that in fact that actually does inspire more people because people are really defeated when we talk about um, single issues devoid of that analysis. Um, a few more points in terms of bridging across movements. I think one of the challenges our movements face is a generational divide. We don't have an institutional memory of, of social justice movements um, in a lot of movements and so a lot of times we're uh, reinventing the wheel or learning or, and making the same mistakes, facing the same challenges. And so I think that's a, a key thing that we, we need to figure out is how do we build more effective movements that are sustainable and that are intergenerational in real ways um, so that we can learn from previous generations that have built and built solidarity across movements. Um, and connected to that is, of course, the importance of social relations. A lot of our movements are, are, are transient. Movements ebb and flow, and that's the, the natural way that they go. But part of that is because movements aren't necessarily part of our social lives. And by that, I mean that a lot of organizing is seen as separate from our day-to-day -day social reproduction of life, right? And so how do we build movements that actually sustain us so that the movements are sustainable? Um, and I think that's a key part to building intergenerational movements and a key part to bridging between movements because when we build our social relations in such a way that we are in community with diverse people, um, then naturally the movements that flow from our life and as a function of our life and as a function of our lived realities um, end up naturally, as Bridget pointed to, um, having much more cross-connection. Um, the last thing that I, I want to say in terms of bridging across movements is that while it's important to build and bridge across movements, it's also important not to talk about bridging movements as a simple kind of unity. Um, and I think that's a key lesson from the global justice movement, where I think one of the things that happened in the global justice movement was all movements were kind of seen as, I have no better word to describe this, but it's kind of on equal footing, if you will. Um, and I think in different moments, we have to be attuned to which movements are in leadership. And I think that's one of the failures of the global justice movement. So for example, there can't be just unity with indigenous movements. We have to be taking leadership from indigenous movements. And so being in unity with indigenous movements means being in solidarity with indigenous movements, taking leadership from frontline communities. Um, and that would be the same for other kinds of struggles, right? So while we need to bridge across movements, I think part of that needs to include an analysis of who is in a leadership role when we're bridging. And I think that is also one of the failures of what building unity means, because a lot of times if we don't see that we are able to take a leadership role in a coalition, for example, then we think that it's not really worth our time, right? Because our issue isn't being represented. And so I think being attuned to when unities uh, or when coalitions are being built kind of with equal partners and when coalitions are being built based on a framework of taking leadership and offering solidarity, that makes a difference um, when we're talking about uh, how to bridge across movements. And I just want to end with uh, one quick example which I think has, um, particularly across North America, not just Canada, that's been building and that has uh, 
an inspiring kind of potential, and potential is the wrong word, but possibility, um, and Bridgette pointed to this, but that was a, the struggle against, against the tar sands, and I'm sure Clayton will speak more to this, so I'll just say briefly that you know, what we've seen is definitely an alliance um, between climate justice, environmental justice movements, and frontline indigenous communi communities with the leadership of indigenous communities. But we can also see, um, and but that needs to be explored much more in terms of bridging movements, is what's the relationship to labor? What's the relationship to workers who are working um, in these mines that are working in the tar sands? And they're also facing frontline impacts, right? The health and safety of, of workers, many of whom are from those communities. One of the first people that I remember speaking out against the tar sands was Mike Merkel who was actually formerly employed by the tar sands, right? So some of those workers, um, and he's from Fort Chipewan, um, know very clearly, very directly, what the health and safety impacts of, of that industry is doing, and including, of course, migrant workers who are increasingly brought in to work in resource extractive industries, but also to talk about the war machine, right? Because the largest exports currently for tar sands, even though there's a lot of conversation about international markets, still is going to the United States to fuel the military industrial complex. And so all of the frontline communities who are facing war and occupation at the helm of the, of the military industrial complex are also part of the frontline fight against the tar sands because their communities are also being devastated as a result of this, right? So when we're talking about fossil fuels, consumption at an individual level is not the key issue. We're talking about consumption at a corporate and, and military level. So we need to be looking at the impact of fossil fuels by communities who are impacted by war and occupation. And so. Um, you know, that's just one example of how we can bridge across movements, particularly when we look at all of the front lines that are being impacted by this climate disaster. Um, and so I just want to end with that in terms of uh, a potential example or a possibility of looking at how we can bridge across movements. But of course, there's so many more because we have so many different issues that we face. Um, and so thank you all. And I look forward to different um, comments and, that people have in terms of movements that you all are part of. I should just like drop the mic and be like, yeah. <laughs> every time I get, every time I have to speak after Harsha and Bridget, I'm just like, oh man, well, what, what else is there to say? But uh, no, there's a, there's a lot to say. And you know, I, I, I think that um, I, I want to echo, you know, a lot of the, the sentiments of my co-panelists here. And, and, but before I do that, um, I wanted to first and foremost acknowledge uh, this beautiful territory, this unceded Algonquin land, and the wonderful welcoming that we received yesterday from uh, the Anishinaabe people of this territory. And uh, just to say that as a, as a guest in this land, uh, you know, we'll walk lightly with respect. And uh, I also want to, you know, thank the, the organizers of the social forum, you know, everybody that, that brought us together in a good way. and. Uh, and just put that out there. And I want to thank our, uh, our keynote speaker, Harsha, for sharing this, uh, this uh, plenary session with Bridget and myself um, so that we could make a point together about you know, bridging across social movements. <clears throat> I, think that, I think that, I guess for my part of this, you know, we're living in an interesting time right now. And it, sometimes it's really hard to make sense of the global triple crisis that we face as members of the five-fingered nation. You know, that, that being, of course, the uh, end of the era of cheap energy, you know, the, uh, 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 or so-called cheap energy, you know, the loss of natural capital to sustain our psychotic economic paradigm called capitalism, and of course, catastrophic climate change. Now, these are really, really big, big challenges to overcome as, uh, as, as, like I said, members of the five-fingered nation uh, to try and figure it, figure it out. And we have to figure it out because, you know, um, our, our ability to coexist as part of that sacred circle of life is depending on it. And each and every single one of you that's sitting here today, you know, has a moral obligation um, to politicize yourself, to educate yourself, and to, you know, put your body on the line because... Uh, you know, all of our children, mine included, are depending on us to, to get our shit together. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I guess what I wanted to talk about here is, is a couple of grim realities, you know, and one of them being that 
our enemies, you know, in extractive industries, you know, these psychotic corporations, many of which are operating in the Canadian tar sands up in Cree and Dene territory in northern Alberta, um, they've invested a lot of resources into this, this one really divisive, polarizing, uh, what's the word, dichotomy? The whole jobs versus the environment thing. And, you know, and they've, and they've done a really good job. And just to put into context the amount of money that big oil puts into the jobs versus the environment thing, is that, you know, uh, you know we all kind of made popcorn and sat down and watched the U.S. presidential debates between Obama and Romney. And I think we were all very shocked that neither representative mentioned climate change once in the U.S. debates uh, in the last election of Obama. And the price tag that was paid for by Big Oil not to have climate change mentioned once was $264 million in contributions. And, you know, and that's a drop in the bucket to these, these corporate entities, you know. Um, and I think that it's important to put that into context when we're thinking about power. And, um, you know, the reality of it is when we look at the environmental uh, sector and God bless you know all of our friends in the environmental movement. You know they're they're working hard, but they're fighting a very disproportionate battlefield, especially when they're utilizing a strategic and tactical framework that is top bottom. When they're going into Washington D.C. to lobby congressional leaders, when they're going into Parliament here in Canada to lobby members of Parliament, you know these oil companies are investing a hell of a lot more resources into influ influencing these same holders of power in our government, okay? And it's gotten so perverse that these oil companies are straight up writing government policy, you know? And we've seen that with Bill C-45 and the complete, you know, destruction of the Navigable Waters Act, a critical piece of participatory, uh, uh, a participatory democratic mechanism for Canadian citizens and First Nations alike to engage uh, companies threatening our water. You know, this, this, uh, this, uh, the Greenpeace, they, 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 they let us all know that the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers wrote that legislation, and they found that out through leaked documents. And so, you know, these guys, uh, these, these oil companies, you know, um, they got a lot of power. And on top of them are a bunch of other parasites. You know, if, if big oil is the big mean res dog going through the res terrorizing everybody, then all the freaking mining companies that are based here in Canada terrorizing indigenous peoples around the planet are their nasty little fleas on the back of that big dog. And we have to understand that, 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 you know, there's great power in social movements. And we've seen that power expressed through the Quebec student strikers and them taking out the dynasty, the liberal dynasty in Quebec. Yes, they got back in, you know, but, but we've seen the power of our youth flex when they faced uh, 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 the rising of their tuition fees and student debt, and we've seen the sophistication of their analysis when they organized a base building strategy and educated a whole generation of Quebecois and First Nations in that region uh, on the, the, the whole austerity agenda globally, you know, and I think Harsha eloquently described uh, the strategy in connecting the, the the student debt movement to the whole fight against Plan Nordique. And, you know, I, they, and they deserve a, a, a serious uh, respect for that, you know? And, 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 and I think that other social movement that has demonstrated tremendous power is Idle No More. You know, if we look at the explosion of Idle No More onto the scene 18 months ago, we see an incredible uh, show of how numbers equate to power. We shut down six borders on the U.S.-Canadian crossing. We stopped every single train in the Canada's largest economy in Ontario with only one arrest, okay? And that's, that's a real powerful thing. 
and the international indigenous movement to stop the tar sands and its associated infrastructure has resulted in a reinvigoration and recalculation of the strategy and tactics of the U.S. environmental movement. You know, this is the Keystone XL campaign. You have to understand, this was started by a bunch of like grassroots tribal people, mostly grandmas, okay, who decided that they were going to start reaching out to landowners in South Dakota and Nebraska and they, you know, and start talking about how they're going to stop this threat to the Oglala Aquifer, a source of drinking water to America's breadbasket, entire agricultural industry, you know, and that grew into something. It grew into something because the environmental movement got smacked down. They lost their fight to adopt for the U.S. Congress to adopt the America Energy and Climate Securities Act, a really shitty cap and trade bill, and it got thrown out. Even a shitty one couldn't get past it. So the funders were like, okay, what the hell, environmentalists? We gave you tens of millions of dollars and we still don't have a climate bill. So they had to invest in something else and they decided to invest in base building. You know, some of them, some of them are still doing the same shit, but some of them, you know, were dragged into the same thing that environmental justice communities have been doing for years, and that is organizing. Okay, and expanding on a political base of resistance. And that process resulted in the largest acts of civil disobedience on the steps of the White House since the Vietnam War. You know, and I think that, I think that, you know, all of that work that, you know, started in Alberta by indigenous peoples that spread into BC, you know, with the fight against the Northern Gateway Pipeline and other pipelines like the LNG Pacific Trails Natural Gas Project up there too, you know, to the Kinder Morgan Project, to the Keystone XL in the United States have resulted in the most powerful, you know, government, military superpower in the world delaying a decision four times now. Okay, the U.S. State Department has delayed the decision on the Keystone XL. And so everybody involved in that effort deserves recognition. And social movements deserve recognition because we've held at bay, okay, the, the, the most powerful government on the planet, the most powerful military superpower on the planet because of the power of our social movements, okay? And we forced TransCanada Pipeline to propose the mother of all pipelines, the Energy East Pipeline, and they put that on the table, okay? And what all these pipelines provide, and you can't get caught up in all the BS about these things, it's not one or the other, it's not pipelines or trains. If you look at industry's data, they want all the pipelines. They want all the train capacity. It's not a question of this or that, okay? And when they run out of natural gas in the tar sands to, you know, boil water to separate that oil from the sand, they want to build 13 nuclear reactors up there and use nuclear to make oil. This is how crazy these people are. And so it's really important that we understand power, where things are at. We have a lot of power, but we also as social movements right here, right now at the social forum, the people's social forum have to account. We have to do a power analysis because shit's different here in Canada. And there's a lot of social movement sectors out there that have perceived power Okay, they're, they're, they're thinking the way they, you know, before the omnibus bills. But the fact of the matter is, is we're in a radically different place. And there is a disproportionate amount of responsibility, specifically on indigenous peoples in this country and the native rights-based strategic framework to challenge the privatization of the sacred, to challenge the agenda of big oil and other extractive industries, because all of the other participatory democratic mechanisms have been stripped away. And so people got to get shit straight here. Native people have got to lead this movement. And this movement, okay, is fundamentally rooted in the reconciliation of Canada's controversial colonial history. And that's a good thing, you know? That's a good thing. And I don't know more, you know, one of the ugly things that it brought out was the rampant racism, both interpersonal and systemic, that exists in Canadian society. But the other beautiful thing that it did was it reinforced the fact that if Canadians don't get their shit together and get over their, 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 their weird feelings about how bad Native people got screwed over and actually get proactive about doing something about it and get involved in the reconciliation movement, which is tied to the movement for climate and energy justice and economic justice, 
then you're going to get left in the dust. And quite frankly, I don't, you know. And I say, you know, I, I, I piss people off in the States all the time when I talk down there because I always say, you know, you know, I don't give a shit about NASCAR dads or soccer moms. Because for the most part, most of these people are comfortable. They're not going to make themselves uncomfortable for the movement. They're not going to make their kids uncomfortable, especially, okay? And we have to challenge that, but, but not by directly trying to change their minds or make them get uncomfortable. We have to find other people that sh whose liberation, okay, whose fight against oppression is tied in with ours and expand our political base of resistance to the point where we can have systemic change. And those God-fearing, tax-paying, law-abiding NASCAR dads and soccer moms will follow the laws that we change, okay? So either way, they're gonna be with us. Which brings me to this moment that we live in, and I'll conclude with this. Uh, you know, I love our workers. You know, my own father is a, is a rank-and-file uniform member. He works in the tar sands. My dad is a shop foreman. He fixes all those big electric shovels uh, uh, in the tar sands, in the mines. He's the shop foreman. He's the boss of all the mechanics that fix those big machines. Um, imagine our dinner conversations. <laughs> You know, but I will say this, you know, uh, labor has got a lot of reality to come to, too, as well. You know, the agenda of this government, this neoliberal agenda, you know, uh, our power in influencing Obama, the social and political pressures that he's facing over his inability to act on climate yet in his two administrations, um, has translated into you know, attempts by this government, okay, to negotiate bilateral free trade agreements with the two other biggest economies on the planet. And if we think that the Dutch disease impacts on the manufacturing sector in this country are bad now, imagine what will happen when FIPA gets ratified, the bilateral free trade agreement with China, as well as the bilateral free trade agreement with the European Union, the comprehensive economic trade agreement. You know, we've seen what 20 years of NAFTA have done to human rights, have done to democracy, have done to the environment, have done to, to women, to indigenous peoples, you know? We've seen what it's done. And we know it's wrong. We know that it's not the answer. This agenda, this free market neoliberal agenda is poison for all of us. And we have to understand that the fight against tar sands it's, it's a much bigger piece here, and it goes back to what Harsh is talking about, root causes. And that's where labor has to understand that, you know, we need to get away from trying to, like, fight this narrative about jobs versus the environment. We need to change the narrative. The workers of this country need to unite with the true title holders of this country, as proven by the recent Supreme Court Chilcotin decision. This government has to understand that, you know, has understood the courts of this country recognize that Native people are the true owners of this land. And so workers and Native people, that's what we have to invest in and build out from there, in my opinion. And I think that the strategy, the tactics that we utilize have got to be economic in design. If we're not disrupting commerce in this country, if we're not impacting the business as usual, okay, the, the, if we're not turning around the open for business sign that Harper's waving around at WTO meetings all over the damn planet, G8 meetings, okay, then we're going to be doing this for a lot longer than we need to be, okay? And I want to end uh, 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 just with one last thing, you know, like, our tactics have to be economic in design. We have to shift the narrative from jobs versus the environment to a, to a, to a, 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 a different narrative, you know, one that's visionary. I don't know what it is that's really up to all of you, but our strategy has got to be bigger than electoral cycles. You know, freaking... <laughs> Justin Trudeau, man, you know, the, the crown prince of the liberals, you know, he's in Calgary the other day saying, you know what, I can do better on the pipelines. He's in D.C. saying, Harper sucks on KXL, I'll deliver, you know, give me a freaking break, you know, and then we've got Montclair. I mean, it is absolutely atrocious, the NDP position on Gaza, you know, like...
Give me a fucking break. Give me a break. You know, the, the, this stuff is bigger than party politics, and I, I don't align to any party. I vote, but I'm a sovereigntist, and every one of these political parties is, has screwed over the Indian, okay? Every one of them, to maintain the economic system of this country because of the fact that Canada's wealth is based on, the, on maintaining the Aboriginal suffrage industry, on continuing the dispossession of Indigenous peoples from their lands so that they, industrial activities can have their way so that cities will become new homes to these people, making it so bad on the res that they have to leave so big oil and mining and timber companies could go in and have their way. And so we have to really flip the narrative, folks. We gotta flip the narrative. So I wanna uh, just again say thank you for letting me say this, you know, say this stuff, and uh, I hope I didn't uh, piss you off too much or anything like that, but uh, uh, you know, I don't care. So. <laughs> Hi there. Um, first, I want to thank you all for that was a really powerful, thought provoking, and super energizing presentation. Um, and I think definitely when we're talking about bridging movements, something like this, an event like the People's Social Forum, when we're all coming together and hearing from each other, is pretty pivotal for that. So I think I want to thank everyone who's involved in creating the social forum. So. I was just wondering if uh, you guys could speak to the solidarity that you were talking about, but beyond sort of the pivot points or p convergence spaces or root causes, sort of what, once we come to those places of understanding what our collective issues and um, goals are, how would that sustained solidarity happen, what would it look like across generations, across movements, and across difference? What would that, how can we live that solidarity on a daily basis, like you were talking about, Harsha? Um, what would that look like on a day-to-day -day ba day -day basis beyond these sort of understandings of solidarity and connection? Do you want to answer first, or? Oh, I was suggesting maybe we take a few. Okay. Um, I was just wondering, um, whatever party gets in power, or what's one thing all of us could push together to, that First Nations would want to have a better relationship with uh, all of us to, to move forward together? Like, is there one thing that we could all push for that would uh, um, make uh, First Nations, uh, like, I don't know whether it'd be just, um, I'm not sure I'd, what it. Like, what's a, if we could only do one thing, what would be something, one thing we could all do? Like, uh, maybe d stop the tar sands or, or I'm not, do you understand, kind of? Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Hi, awesome, awesome discussions here. Um, Clayton, you mentioned jobs for the economy, and I know there's tons of money promoting that false message, that false mantra, but it, but it gains traction because it's so easy for a regular person who hasn't, hasn't talked about this to understand, even though it's a lie. Uh, and I think part of our new narrative has to involve what you mentioned, dust disease. It's costing us huge jobs. Uh, the current economic model in the tar sands is a failure. And a lot of people don't realize that. Um, the corporate power deals, NAFTA, CETA, these are not empowering this country or these people. They are impoverishing. And I think people aren't aware of that. Uh, NAFTA destroyed tons of manufacturing jobs. <clears throat> the fact that we're going, and hopefully it doesn't get there, but the fact that we're ruining universal health care is costing us not only our lives, as the tar sands do, but also jobs. So 
and the, and the meltdown with the stock market is still costing us. So this whole neoliberal agenda that we are all condemning as poison, which it is, is also costing us all this. So I think we have to um, reinforce the notion that these petroleum companies and these business people, parasites really, that they're, the money is spreading this messaging of jobs versus the economy is such a huge lie. So if we can build these bridges and incorporate that into part of the bridge building, that these are lies. A lot of people don't know that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much to these amazing panelists, um, their words, and thank you so much for your questions. Um, just wanting to address the question around how do we create sustained solidarity, and in my experience, when I have seen that work beyond, say, yeah, the G20, where is one space that I saw amazing convergences of movements, or these spaces, how do we create a sustained sustain solidarity. I think the first thing that comes to mind is just friendship comes down to who is, you know, at the dinner table, who are at your parties. Um, and those are, how can we maintain those relationships in, in a way that is um, meaningful and, yeah, based on friendship and solidarity. Um, I also think about uh, George Lakey's five stages of social movements, where the first one, you know, is cultural preparation. The second one is organization building. And I think that's a really important one when we're thinking about sustaining our movements. Because when we're part of organizations where solidarity is at the core, we're more likely to sustain our solidarity. Um, so I think of groups like No One Is Illegal, the Indigenous People's Solidarity, um, group that's here in Ottawa, um, the Indigenous Tar Sands Network, um, yeah, different grassroots groups that you can be a part of, Rising Tide, where solidarity is a core principle. And I think if we're then accountable to those groups, we're more likely to continue with those relationships. So start with that. Thanks. Um, yeah, just on the, the question of, of sustaining solidarity b beyond convergences, and I think that's a really important point because it, that's where the bulk of our, our work is. Um, and so like Bridget mentioned, I think social relationships are critical to that solidarity um, because I think one of the things that we do tend to do, particularly for people who come from a campaign-based approach, is we often focus on you know, doing throwing down a blockade or throwing down a fundraiser or something, but without actually having a relationship with the community that we're intending to be in solidarity with. And so I think that is critical um, in terms of building those social relationships and sustaining solidarity. And thank you for bringing that up um, because oftentimes solidarity isn't sustained because one of the tendencies is that when there's a crisis flash moment, people jump from crisis to crisis to crisis um, and don't sustain or aren't able to sustain a relationship, an ongoing relationship, either with a directly impacted frontline community or across movements. Um, and I think one of, there's, there's various things that we can do, like Bridget mentioned, being part of groups that have ongoing sustained relationships so that we know that there's um, a continuity in terms of accountability. Um, but I think one of the, the things that we do have to do is actually prioritize long-term relationships. And I want to emphasize the longevity of it because one of the things that I've learned is that oftentimes when we come into a community when, when there's a crisis in order to offer solidarity and offer support, the kinds of things that are wanted in the long term are completely different than what we may imagine. Um, and that's the most amount of growth that I've been able to do in terms of actually learning what solidarity means, right? So once a blockade goes down, the kind of support that folks need, whether it's fundraising or building a community garden or helping with a community-led education program. Um, last summer, I was invited in to teach Indian math <laughs> as part of a native youth movement program um, that was part of an unschooling program. And so I was like, I don't even remember it because I was like eight years old and hated math but I was invited in to teach math from India. <laughs> so I was like, all right. Um, so the kinds of things we're invited in to do, um, really, that's what, how we learn, right? And that's how we learn from different movements and different communities. 
because we have to learn beyond just having a shared analysis, although that's critical, and actually understanding our different worldviews and our different lived experiences. Um, and there's there's so much more to that, but I think, also, and also just being part of people's lives, because the kind of emotional labor that's involved in solidarity, I think, is often unspoken. Um, but I think emotional labor that's part of solidarity and part of our daily life, I think, is critical and central to being part of effective solidarity movements because when people think know that they can rely on us in good ways and wholesome ways and that we will be present because we care about people and not just the issues they represent um that's when solidarity i think is sustained yeah <laughs> no um I guess I'll address the second question um, uh, of regarding uh, is there one solution or one main thing we can all do or society at large can do to make the native happy? Um, no, it's, it's a lot more complex than that. And I think that, you know, as we go through the process of getting politicized, we have to be very, very acutely aware of this thing called reductionism. Because um, when, we, when we get involved in trying to reduce things down, highly complex political landscapes, race relations, gender relations, systems of oppression, and how they manifest in our social movements and keep us divided, um, we gotta be really careful with that. Because that's, that's like a common tactic of like, you know, like uh, white supremacy, for example. You know, they reduce things. And it's important to, 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 to do your research, to do your work, I mean, there's a lot of things that we've got to address right at the beginning to, you know, heal the gunshot wound that this country has in its chest bleeding out, you know, that is its colonial history and its ongoing termination policies on indigenous peoples and our collective rights. Um, but there's, you know, there's a whole world of, uh, of things we've got to do, um, you know, uh, and different political actions that we can take. So it's a lot more complex and I, I don't have an easy answer to that question. Um, because it's big, there is not just one thing. There's a million things you can do. Um, what the, on, on the brother that got up and talked about the urgency of the of the trade agreement stuff, you know this stuff is really bad. Um, you know the energy chapter and the investor state chapters of uh, of the FIPA and the CETA, these two bilateral free trade agreements are scary. Like this government basically just wrote off the whole British Columbian economy. Okay, because China, and not Chinese people or Chinese society, okay, Chinese capitalists, okay, like the state petroleum firm PetroChina and Sinopec have acquired 10% of the $300 billion of assets at play in the tar sands in just about 18 months. Okay, these guys, these companies have a lot of money. And, um, you know, the, the FIPA has an investor state provision in it that allows, just like NAFTA, that allows uh, you know, any kind of uh, barrier to economic, uh, uh, to, the, to the profits uh, through trade uh, to be blocked, to be challenged in secret WTO tribunals. Okay, and those tribunals, 99.98% of the time, always vote in favor of the corporations. And then its taxpayers are on the hook for loss of profits. And so if British Columbia, the government and First Nations and society at large, the fishermen unions, uh, uh, ecotourism industry, they block this gateway and it gets challenged and FIPA's ratified, you know, theoretically, these, China could sue BC for the loss of $33 billion in investment that, that they just did in the tar sands. And it's important to understand valuation here, okay? Because when, 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 you know, when they invest $33 billion into buying the leases to develop in the tar sands, it, it's a lot more actually that, they're, that it's valued at. You know, this is really important to understand when we're thinking about, the, for example, the Harper Economic Action Plan, the $650 billion economic action plan. That's only the leasing sales and the taxes and stuff that they'll acquire. What we're actually talking about is $40 trillion in natural resources, you know, that are at stake here. And all of the consequences of trying to develop those over the ridiculous 10-year time frame that they've laid out in their economic action plan. 
There's very significant consequences to a lot of this stuff and the scale of it, the valuation of it, the socioeconomic impacts of it are really quite, quite important to understand. Um, so, you know, workers, indigenous peoples, we have a lot of things to do um, as far as, you know, flexing some of the, the power we've got. But, you know, we really need, for example, Unifor to really back up what they committed to doing at their last, uh, at the launch of their union last year. They said they would invest 10% of their overhead into social unionism strategies to politicize their base from the locals to the national, and that they would also invest in external social movement apparatuses. And all the unions, okay, when we look at social movement sectors, have the systemic capabilities to actually sustain social movements through their due structure, their fee structure. Other social movements don't necessarily have that infrastructure yet, but could if our brothers and sisters in the labor movement build, you know, collaborated with us right now and helped us build those things out in a good way, in a, in a long-term strategy. And so I think that there's, there's a lot more there, but I'll leave it at that. I was just going to add one thing to what Clayton was mentioning about uh, the free trade agreements and, and FIPA and CETA in particular and investor state arbitration. Just by way of example, people are probably familiar, but a Vancouver mining company, Pacific Rim, is currently suing the El Salvador government under uh, investor state arbitration because El Salvador has a de facto mining um, moratorium. And so that's a very clear example of, of the ways in which state governments can be sued or municipal governments can be sued by corporations. Um, but the one thing that's important to highlight with that is a lot of the conversations around free trade agreements of late, as opposed to, say, during the global justice movement, is the ones that Canadians are most likely to oppose are the ones where Canada is seen as a quote-unquote junior partner. So there's a fear of what the impact will be, for example, of the Canada FIPA or the FIPA agreement or CETA, for example, because it's seen as affecting Canadian jobs, it's seen as affecting um, the economy within Canada, but we don't see a similar outroar in the majority of free trade agreements which Canada is a part of, where Canada is actually the imperialist partner, um, right? Where the human rights violations and the economy of countries in the global south are being devastated. And so I think it's really important that when we're talking about opposing free trade agreements, that it's just as important to highlight Canada's imperialist role in the global south and how the majority of free trade agreements that Canada is participating in is ones where it's not the Canadian economy being destroyed, but where it's economies in the global south. And that's a really important lesson to bring back from the global justice movement because we need to have an analysis of Canada in the world. We need to have an analysis of what Canadian mining companies, Canadian corporations, Canadian capital, and the Canadian state is doing. Right now, one key thing that we can do is absolutely demand that every single social movement in every political party demand that Canada withdraw from the Canada-Israel agreement. Canada has a long-standing free trade agreement with Israel. That is one that can clearly be put pressure on right now, given what's happening in occupied Palestine, that's happening in Gaza, that we need to put pressure on. And so when we're talking about rebuilding and bringing back um, a framework of opposing free trade agreements, because it's absolutely true that we need to bring that back, um, like has been mentioned, that we do it within a systemic framework of the entire framework of free trade agreements that Canada is implicated in. And we really want to be able to stay in touch with all of you. Um, so we're going to send a sign-up sheet if you just want to put your name, email, and if you want to receive updates with No One Is Illegal, with Idle No More, or with the Council of Canadians, just check. Thank you. Um, this question was partly answered by the bridging social movements beyond um, convergences question, but I'm wondering, Harsha, you brought up um, institutional or movement memory and the intergenerational gap, and um, Bridget, you kind of talked about how there's a few connector people who play a key role in bridging these movements, and um, I'm wondering, because um, I... Uh, I learned from stories of older activists, just like a tiny proportion of the vast, amazing history um, of activism and social movements that they've been a part of. And there's so much I don't know. And it seems like, it always seems this generation thinks, oh, we're on the brink of like bridging these movements finally. But we've just lost this history that it took uh, decades to build it up before. And it 
fell apart when maybe some of these connectors dropped out, um, couldn't continue to be part of organizing, got older, whatever it was. So I'm wondering uh, from all of you, what kind of processes um, can we all um, engage in to make sure that we sustain these movements intergenerationally so that you know, we're not always building them up again? Thanks. I believe it was you that said yesterday on Parliament steps that uh, it's capitalism and colonialism that is the actual, I don't know if you said evil, but that's where it stands. Um, uh, Mike, I'll do, am I, are, you, are you okay? All right. Um, I think our real problem, I think, you know, it, in action, it's, it's rather easy to attain solidarity, right? It's in our conceptual lives that we, we fall apart. We really need a, a, a comprehensive language that we don't have because we actually all speak capitalism. It's, uh, and we, we tend, uh, the economy, since everything is uh, contextual, right, we, we, we become what we, we do, right, more so than we, the other way. Um, I think we have, to, we have to watch what we say, it's our language. Uh, like when you said um, ownership, that really rubs against me because in its purity, ab Aboriginal or Indigenous would not tolerate any kind of concept of ownership per se, right? And I think we have to stop using that as a, as a, a mental thing. And the other thing I wanted to say is that actually when push comes to pull, we're all Indigenous, right? I was born here in Canada. I, was, I uh, grew up on a farm in Oshawa. The, uh, the creek that I used to uh, swim in is now a drainage ditch of some sort. I can't even find it. <laughs> uh, so I guess that's what I, I just, I just want, I think our emphasis is really on language. We have a language problem that we really have to focus on. And I really, truly appreciate the, our history. Our, it is, it's been atrocious. So, thank you. <laughs> uh, my name is Leith. Uh, I'm a Palestinian and indigenous rights activist and a media uh, access uh, activist. Um, thank you very much for mentioning Palestine and Gaza. Um, my question is for Clayton. Uh, from uh, our experience as Palestinians, uh, um, there was uh, uh, a part of the Palestinians that stayed inside Israel and our citizens uh, worked to create their own uh, parties that actually uh, speak to their rights. You know, we have, you know, historically here in Canada, as you mentioned, all parties have been really... Uh, um, really bad for the native people, no matter what. Maybe there's a few exceptions here and there, like Libby Davis, that have a good writing that supports them and allows them to take positions for Palestine, for, for native rights, and so forth. But in general, historically, even the NDP in the times of the British Columbia, when they were in, in charge at the uh, uh, Gustafsson Lake, the Chipatin Lake standoff, and so forth, were very uh, uh, problematic to the native people, uh, to say the least. Exactly, exactly. 77,000 rounds of ammunition on 10 uh, native elders uh, protecting their land to, to perform their uh, sun dance. And so I have been kind of an, on one way uh, shocked that over the decades, you know, I've been here almost 20 years now and I'm not still, I'm not a landed immigrant by the way, uh, uh, but uh, that there hasn't been any movement there to actually create native parties. There is all this talk about sovereignty and also there's no talk about, uh, you know, separation, you know, there is no talk about uh, 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 secession from Canada where the native people are the majority in the majority of the land 
that is not on the border of Canada, on the Canada-US border or on the highways. The rest of the land is populated by the native people. So that's something that I was kind of wondering, is there any movement towards creating a native party that represents the native people and their rights and maybe lead on to secession? Because this will shake Canada if that happens. And the other issue is that as Palestinians, one of the things that actually have helped us uh, constantly is that we were able to create media outlets uh, and so forth that m send our message globally. Where uh, you know, in Canada, as as a co uh, British colonial settler project, out of all the British colonial settler projects, it is the most successful in erasing the image and the history of the native people to the rest of the world. So everybody, when they say Israel. They remember the Palestinians, or you know, in that uh, British colonial project. When they say the United States, they say cowboy and Indian. When you say uh, uh, Australia, they say ab Aboriginal. When you say New Zealand, they say Maori. But when you come and ask a person from outside Canada, out of nowhere, you ask them about Canada, they say polar bear, moose, snow. But they don't even remember the native person. So those two issues are, f for me, I'm wondering if there is any movement into creating those media outlets that are internationalized and can, you know, uh, uh, send a message, and and a movement to create like a party that represents the native people before these elections happen. Yeah. Um. I'll start with the brother. Uh and, and what he shared regarding, you know, the, the use of language. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess I could be more cautious in, in, in using the English language, but, it, you know, it's not the first language of my people, nor the other, you know, you know hundreds of, of, of dialects of indigenous language speakers in this country. And, and there's an element of that that's part of the answer to your query as well, as far as the diversity of sovereign nations that exist within the settler colonial state of Canada. This is a little bit more complex than the Palestine-Israel thing, or the New Zealand-Maori thing, or the Australian Aborigine. Like it's, 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 it's a, there's a lot of native nations in North America, in, in Turtle Island. Um, you know, uh, of course, uh, uh, I would, uh, I guess, first let me just say, I don't, I don't prescribe to reductionism, okay? And we're not all indigenous, okay? Canadian people here are not, you're not indigenous to Canada, okay? You may have been born here, your grandparents may have migrated here, or their parents may have migrated here, but you're not indigenous to this place. Okay, indigenous, the definition in the Webster Dictionary is naturally occurring flora or fauna. In other words, from our perspective, put there by creator. Okay, so you're indigenous to somewhere in the world, but not here. Okay, I am. Um, and there's a difference there. And when we think, when we look at that difference within the context of a political... Uh, uh, strategic and tactical framework as far as the sovereignty movement, it's absolutely integral that we don't try and reduce that to the whole we're all indigenous somewhere argument because that's reducing, um, uh, 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 you know, decades and decades and centuries and centuries of political organizing by indigenous peoples to, you know, work within the oppressive colonial structures to try and create the bare minimum standards so that settler colonial states um, can at least have a baseline to set their domestic indigenous engagement policy framework. And that's what the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. And right in the UN Charter, um, it, it, it stipulates that, you know, only indigenous peoples have the right to self-determination and, 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 and sovereignty, whereas other uh, cultural groups, religious groups, gender, whatever, do not. Okay, and this is an absolutely critical victory that we acquired through a whole lot of suffering um, to get that clear definition. And so there's a whole legal, historical legal construct that actually invalidates that statement, you know? And it's a very important one to recognize because, you know, that, that is the essence, you know, like there's this, everybody, all the grammar people always get 
all confused and media always gets confused because they're like, why do you always have to put that S at the end of indigenous peoples? And people don't understand the political history behind that S at the end of indigenous peoples. There was decades and hundreds of delegations that went to the UN General Assembly to advocate for that S to be added to the end of indigenous peoples because it's the difference between the recognition of our collective rights versus individual rights. Okay, and our power, our political power that we have here, especially in the context of natural resources and how they're developed, is rooted in our collective sovereign rights, which is defined by that S at the end of indigenous peoples. So, you know, if I minimized or reduced in my own short little speech um, how important language is, our brother's absolutely right. Um, you know, we do need to be very careful how we use it. Um, as far as the use, me using the term of ownership, um, you know, fair point, you know, kudos. Uh, you know, I think that indigenous peoples, when we talk about ownership, it's within the context of, uh, I guess the word in the English language would be steward, that we have, a oblig there's an obligation to think about economy within the context of seven generations. Three generations behind us, the one that we're living in, and three ahead of us. That is how we have to think about politics, economics, social systems, and spirituality within that context of seven generations. And there's a whole course load of teachings about that that I don't have time to talk about right now. So thank you for bringing up your comments. Um, now related to the, the political party organizing history, there's been different attempts to you know, create political, First Nations political party. Uh, my uncle actually started it in Manitoba. Um, I think there's a real concrete uh, history of trying to get indigenous peoples into parliament over the years, particularly in Manitoba and Saskatchewan in the 70s. My father was a part of that. Um, a big movement, you know, to get representation within parliament. And I think that that's kind of experiencing a renaissance now, particularly in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, where it's the majority native people and where we could actually have some success in electing indigenous uh, parliamentarians. Um, I'm not an expert on that. I don't really, you know, again, I'm a sovereigntist, so, it, you know, it doesn't matter what political parties in the colonial house, they all have a fiduciary and legal obligation, okay, that's rooted in concepts like the two-row wampum, where, hey, well, sure, well, let's share the land, let's share the water, let's share the resources, but don't get in our canoe and we won't get in yours, and uh, we'll go down the river together and, you know, maybe slap high fives in between, you know. Um, but, uh, but I think that, I think that um, you know, the reality of it is, is that there's a much bigger complexity there and there are no pan-Aboriginal solutions, no pan-Aboriginal policy um, that will address the multiplicity of uh, land claims, of uh, Aboriginal claim, title claims, of, uh, you know, of, of, of uh, you know, they're all different. And, and the fact of the matter is, it's up to each individual First Nation that the British Crown, now the Canadian Crown, signed into treaty with or made uh, or, or, or are legally liable to um, honor that relationship. And the fact of the matter is, is whether or not Canada survives as a settler colonial state, um, you know, like the Palestinian, we will be here no matter what. You know, no matter what they throw at us, they cannot defeat our resiliency. And so, you know, there's no easy answer to that question and the things that you have observed in the time that you've been here. But uh, one thing I can say is that there are, there are, are, it's a war of attrition. This government is involved in a war of attrition to devolve its federal fiduciary obligations defined by the trust relationship and the racist Indian Act. And there have been attempts to give that pan-Aboriginal blanket response to that fiduciary obligation, that legal obligation, um, like the Indian Act, the White Paper of 1969, the First Nations education, control over education. That, like, there's a multiplicity of policy frameworks that have been thrown on the table and then ripped up and thrown back at the government because the government
has to deal with each individual First Nation. And the only reason that we're still here today um, is because Canada is a member of the G8. Or the only reason, I guess, that we're not dealing with the level of military uh, oppression that's happening in the global south and in places like Palestine is because of, uh, 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 you know, we're in this G8 developed industrialized nation and, but, you know, who knows what's going to happen? I mean, if you look at like El Zapoktog, what you, you know you described in Gustafsson Lake, like that was a screwed up situation. They used land like Lloyd Axworthy was negotiating the landmine ban federally, uh, internationally at that time with like Princess Diana, and the Canadian state, the RCMP, used landmines against two native protesters in Gustafsson Lake. Miraculously, they jumped out of the truck when their truck got blown up by the landmine. And then they use 77,050 caliber rounds on these two guys while they're swimming across the frickin' lake. You can watch this shit on YouTube, okay? You can watch, and CBC, CTV, Glo nobody would air this shit on the national uh, news, but it happened in this country. And um, so I think that there's a, a considerable amount of, 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 of uh, understanding by native people in this country that there's tremendous uh, benefit to international pressure on Canada because while the Canadian government doesn't give a shit about human rights in Canada and they've made that very clear they definitely care what other people think about them particularly their friends in the G8 elite club and so we've utilized international media strategies on the indigenous tar sands campaign. We've gone to Europe and lobbied the EU. We've you know, developed slick direct action campaigns against the European oil majors, against the US oil majors. We've created that pressure using social media primarily, but also you know, very sophisticated earned media strategies. But there needs to be a much more investment in that. And that's where Idle No More comes in. Idle No More, in a matter of 18 months, has created a, uh, their own database of over 400,000 people in their list, which represents an uh, unprecedented shift, because for the first time, Native people, land defenders, control a uh, media capacity and outreach capacity to reach the planet without relying on unions or environmental organizations or other big social justice organizations to amplify our voice. So when they do what they've always done and lend us the solidarity with this newfound infrastructure, our voice is getting a lot louder. And that's why when Elza Puktuk happened this year, in 48 hours we had 140 Idle No More solidarity actions in support of the Mi'kmaq and Elza Puktuk, including protests at every single U.S. consular office in every major U.S. city, okay, and the federal government of Canada have lost their shit over that, okay, and we need to invest in that kind of capacity um, and build up those narrative-based storytelling strategies and build the infrastructure to get those pieces out because investing in a counter-military intelligence framework against the settler state of Canada is a losing strategy. But when you get Takaya Blaney, the 12-year-old in the Salish Sea singing a song about how Enbridge is going to kill all the dolphins and killer whales and salmon her people depend on against the corporate CEO of Enbridge and all of their lawyers and scientists, scientists and statisticians, no matter what, her song is going to move people into the streets against all the statistics and legal BS that these corporations put against her. So media, narrative-based storytelling strategies, base building, organizing, spaces like this is what is going to shift that dynamic and Canada is a low-hanging fruit in the G8 there's only 30 million people in this country there's more people in the state of California and we have a opportunity here to dramatically challenge the global austerity agenda and neoliberalism in this country it's vulnerable okay and there's a there's a straight up there's a straight up formula. Canada only has the resources and the, the police power to maintain 14 conflict, First Nations conflicts. Anytime it goes above 14 conflicts, the state is forced to make concession and they're forced to back off. And that's why this is such an exciting time because 
First Nations are waking up, our young people are waking up, and other social movement sectors are recognizing the power of the native rights-based strategic framework to influence systemic change in this country. And all the while, to boot, we're really bolstering the, re the reconciliation movement and helping people get over our controversial colonial history in a way that's healthy, in a way that's proactive. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, OK, thank you to all the panelists for all the things that you said. Um, and I just want to uh, start by saying I am not indigenous to Canada. I'm definitely not. Uh, I'm from the States, and I would never claim to be from Canada uh, or indigenous here. Um, so I was just curious, one of the things that you talked about, Clayton, was um, that there is no need necessarily to make people uncomfortable, that the NASCAR dads and the soccer moms will eventually be on board with whatever people end up getting like governments to change the laws, they'll just follow along. But I'm just curious, because uh, there's, uh, there's a campaign that I'm involved with called Put Food in the Budget, and we work on uh, anti-poverty issues, trying to make the provincial government increase social assistance rates. And a lot of the actions and strategies that we take are sort of to make people uncomfortable, because poverty is not a comfortable situation, and nor are most of the other you know, movements that people are working on, they're not they're not comfortable. Uh, so I'm just curious, uh, you know, what, what would you say, like how do you use people's complacency to create uh, change or uh, build bases in different movements? And that can be either of you if you have an answer. Thank you. Uh, yes, good morning and thank you very, very much for this very interesting panel. Um, I'd just like to address the issue of building movements and intergenerational connections. Now, the strength, one of the big strengths of the native communities is the power of those old women, the elders of their society. Now, unfortunately, in the white majority settler communities that we live in, our power has been taken away from us. It was taken away from us perhaps as far back as the witch hunts and then you look at the folklore and then you look at the fairy stories and you get images of old women as witches as frightening as ugly and that is perpetuated in our society where we are considered to be unproductive burdens ugly etc etc so i would suggest that women be returned, that old women be returned to their place, their place, their natural place is that of leading, of guiding, of using their judgment and their wisdom to guide the younger generations and that's what we have to do. And I think in terms of building these uh, communities and building our social movements, the role of old women as central is essential. Thank you. Hey, how you doing? Hello, how you doing? Uh, I'm here from uh, New Brunswick, and I was there at Elsa Bookduck for the uh, protests, for the shale gas protests. I thought it absurd seeing the militarization there. Um, and since then, I've been traveling around the Maritimes, talking to a lot of people, and I've had some very serious discussions with some people, as, such as Eliza Knockwood, you might know. Um, and the, the, the point that we've come to is that this continually asking people to do something else, which is what a lot of protests have been, is to ask these politicians to do something, is, is falling on deaf ears because there's no legal, even if we have a, a petition with you know, 10 million signatures, there's no legal framework to force them to abide by that. So what's been talked about is to be able to get, especially a lot of the native community, to step up and take an active role in the politics in this country as, as politicians, not just as sideliners or as lobbyists, but as actual politicians. And I think a, a big uh, obligation that's come upon uh, us activists is to, to, to no longer keep asking for other people to do stuff, but to step up and, and then we need the communities to, to kind of come together and support these individuals who are willing to step up and take an active role. Because as long as we continue to ask somebody else to do it, they're not gonna do anything. It, it, we, need to take, we need to take the power back. And I mean, you look at the Harper government right now, it got into power by about 16 or 17 percent of Canadians who could have gone to vote voting for him. And that's kind of scary. So we, 
we, I've, I've had a lot of discussions on this and I, I'd kind of be interested to hear some of your guys' opinion on, on how, how much you think we could step up before the next election? Because, I mean, you see the deterioration, even the NDP right now, I mean, there's, there's MPs walking away from the NDP right now because Mulcair's new leadership is gone down the drain. It's another corporate sponsorship. And, and we need a viable option moving forward because the three major parties aren't going to be acting for us. And I, and I have one other thing, planning forward until, se uh, until seven generations, solar's the way to go. I'm on my way to BC to work on Canada's biggest solar, solar installation. It's like a 12 megawatt station in uh, Kimberley, BC, and I can't wait to bring that back to the Maritimes. So we'll take one more question and then we're gonna wrap it up for lunch. It's less of a question and just kind of something moving forward um, and visioning the future. Talking about what we can do, I know that uh, David Suzuki is doing his last, he says his last tour across Canada, and the idea is to raise the awareness that if we can ingrain municipally, provincially, and then federally in our constitution, which we should already have protection of our waters, of the land, of the food that we eat, that can give us something to stand upon, at least within the systems that we're operating. As we're trying to discuss and negotiate with the systems as at present, so much has been wiped away for protection of our waterways and of the land use. So something I think we really need to work towards is building ourselves together and petitioning for charter protection of all our natural resources that we truly need for our survival. It's so basic that we just need clean air, food and water, and then community for our happiness and our continuation. So I think that's something we need to look forward in is coming together and getting stuff enshrined in a charter that we can stand on, at least in the legality of courts. Um, I want to thank you all for speaking today and for giving us such um, energy and movement forward and visioning, but that's something I just want to leave maybe as on the horizon after this, what can we do? Come together and start trying to petition for some more charter protection because we can at least stand on that, not just for ourselves, but for Mother Earth and for Father Sky. Thank you very much. <laughs> I can't remember what that sister is. She's still here, the first one who asked the question. What did you ask again? I was just asking about uh, like whether or not there's a way to have food work placement. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I didn't want to forget that because that's important. Um, I didn't say that it's not important to make NASCAR dads and soccer moms uncomfortable. I said, I don't give a shit. And I, and I projected my own personal uh, uh, generalization, which maybe was unfair on NASCAR dads and soccer moms, that they wouldn't probably choose to put themselves in an uncomfortable position, or their kids especially, right? Um, the whole quality of life argument that you hear in the labor movement quite a, lo quite a lot, um, and in other, other, other movements. Um, you know, I think it's absolutely important to make people uncomfortable, and we do it all the time. Um, what I was referring to in my comment was that we need to invest in base building strategies because the more we invest in our own political base of resistance, the more we achieve uh, uh, getting to that point of critical mass, which I do believe we're at, uh, at this particular uh, movement cycle. Um, um, you know, when we change the system, all of those law-abiding, tax-paying, God-fearing citizens are going to follow those laws. Begrudgingly, maybe, but they will. And so, you know, it's really up to us to not try and get mired in that whole thing where people think they have to change everybody's opinion. You know, because white patriarchy is very powerful. Um, you know, and, and is, you know, trying to change some, some particular old white men, no offense to the old white men in the audience, but they're stubborn old dogs. And, and it takes a lot of energy to, to try and change their opinions. So it's like, well, you know, if the laws change, you're gonna follow anyway and be on our side anyway. So let's just find folks who already, whose liberation, whose oppression is tied in with your own and, and utilize that pathway. Because if you look at the history of social movements, um, that's really the only time that, 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 that things have changed is when you create enough political pressure um, for, for a big sea change moment, right? It's never been from trying to cater to the bastions of power. You know, the politicians always follow at the movement. It's never the other way around. <laughs>
okay? And so it's important to recognize that. Um, as far as what our grandmother who just spoke said about the importance of the leadership of women, you know, the I don't know more thing is a really beautiful thing. And it's fraught with lateral violence and screwed up stuff. Like, don't idealize it, you know? All, you know, all of the I don't know more people and networks, there's over 700 chapters that popped up just instantly. Um, you know, it, it, there's a lot of challenges, let's just say that. Um, but what I will say, though, is that the difference between I don't know more and, say, the American Indian movement, uh, and in between that, um, you know, the Native Youth Movement, Red Power Movement, um, is that I don't know more came from women. You know, and, 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 and as such, it, it came from a place of that sacred feminine creative principle which is different than what, say, the American Indian Movement was. You know, the American Indian Movement, you know, was an attempt uh, to do a counter-military intelligence framework against the U.S., and they got taken out really effectively by a relatively small CIA program, COINTELPRO, you know, which was all about creating paranoia amongst a very small core of leadership. And to this day, the leaders of the American Indian Movement that are alive, you know, still are paranoid about each other. They don't talk to each other, you know, and they all hate each other. That's why you got AIM West, AIM Colorado, AIM Grand Council in Minnesota, AIM Oklahoma, and they all, they don't ever hang out, you know, and it's the same old Indians that were in the 70s um, still representing AIM today, and they haven't invested in that intergenerational strategy to lift up new leaders, and there's a lesson to be learned there. So, you know, I don't know more to me is a very exciting thing because it represents what I believe is, uh, you know, what our grandmother was saying, that we have, to, we have to directly challenge, and this goes back to what Harsha was talking about, the root, you know, and, 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 and this whole economic engine, that the, this domineering, controlling, violent system of economy that we live in is coming out of an imbalance between the energy of man Hello? And the energy, between the energy of man and the energy of woman. And I think that, you know, when in the, in the fight for climate and energy justice in the, you know, 15 or so years I've been organizing from Alaska to Mexico and all around the planet where indigenous communities are rising up against big oil and mining companies, it's always been our grandmothers and mothers that, 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 are, that start organizing. And they're doing it not because they want to fight neoliberalism or they want to fight, you know, whatever. They're doing it because of their sacred obligation as women to protect the water. And they're doing it to protect their kids. And, and that's a really powerful thing. And, and, you know, and we need to look at that leadership in a really concrete way. And, you know, in Indian country, we have our own battle. Like, we got our old boys club in Indian leadership, too. You know, you look at our, our most cherished uh, leader, you know, our, our biggest living hero, Phil Fontaine. I mean, this guy works for Trans Canada Pipeline now. The guy that got the government to apologize for 100 years of residential school, and rape and genocide of our kids, is now trying to build a pipeline across the country that's going to poison, you know, generations ahead of us kids' access to clean water. And a lot of people in Winnipeg in the native community got divided when a group of women showed up at the University of Winnipeg and they shut down his speech over the winter. They shut down his speech and they said, we're doing it in defense of water because you're going to poison our kids' water. And then a lot of the Indian elite, because we have our own middle class, they said, oh no, you know, you're breaking traditional protocol, he's an elder. You're disrespecting him. You should let him talk. You know, fuck that. If you work for oil companies, native or not, expect resistance, okay? And that's just the way it is. And, 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 and you know, it, it's, it's a, this stuff is divisive, but I do believe that, um, you know, we'll be in a lot better place off if, if, if we really 
find ways as social movements to lift up and 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 that leadership that come from the woman you know that power it's a it's 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 a big thing so um i forget the other questions yeah, building on what you said on shaking that complacency, in my experience, I've seen some people who have been not active in social movements and um, really loving video games, nothing to hate on video games, but like that being sort of what they do. And I have a good friend who went to the Tar Sands Healing Walk and recently was politicized and when you give people um, the chance to see the injustice for themselves, that is something that can shake people up and move them from being complacent to being outraged or to um, seeing that we need another way. Um, and I think on the issue of how we can step it up, for the next election and how far are we going to go to step it up. There are a lot of amazing initiatives that are taking place to uh, make sure that Harper is gone. And I agree that it is way beyond Harper. It is colonialism, it is capitalism. But one urgent challenge that we face is defeating the Harper government, given what we've seen in this past year in terms of cuts to refugee health care, in terms of the attacks on indigenous rights, um, a number of other things. Um, and so, yeah, there are some inspiring campaigns. One example is organizing in strategic swing ridings where there was a small margin of victory. Um, and it's going to be, you know, hands on deck, all hands on deck for making sure that this happens. Um, and beyond that, it's, yeah, taking nonviolent direct action and holding whatever government is in power to account to making sure that they are representing the interests of the people and not the interests of the elites. For the question about intergenerational building, I think that's a really good question. And um, as someone who is from youth movements, it's really inspiring to learn from elders, to learn from people who have been organizing for many years. Um, for example, when we were in BC and the Enbridge pipeline was recently um, approved and a lot of people are planning uh, re blockades. And so one of the things that we've done is we've spoken with people who have done effective blockades. Um, for example, people um, from the Haida Nation who blockaded against logging and asking them uh, to share some of their wisdom. And um, people who are part of the Clayquot sound protests, asking them to share some of their wisdom. So creating those spaces where we can hear from elders their experience um, and share their knowledge. One of the other ways we've seen that, Clayton was talking about the importance of economic uh, disruption in terms of system change. And uh, one of those um, key economic pieces around, is around the divestment. And uh, we've seen the student movement learning from elders in terms of divestment as well, uh, which has been really inspiring. Went to a divestment workshop divesting from fossil fuels workshop and we had some people in the audience who were part of the uh, South African divesting um, from apartheid movement and they had incredible experiences to share with us and so we can see how how that starts to happen when we create those spaces and when we also intentionally reach out to our elders to learn from them. So I think we're going to wrap um, pretty soon. Sorry, I just remembered the whole, like, let's get natives elected to parliament thing. Um, yeah, you know, there's a deeper context here. You know, on August, uh, I think it was August 1st, it was the uh, 250th year anniversary of the Turo Wampum, uh, the Treaty of Niagara. And, you know, the Turo Rompom was an agreement that was signed between over 2,000 First Nations leaders and the Crown. 
and that those two rows on that wampum belt represent two canoes one representing the government the governance of indigenous peoples of this land and one representing the governance of the guests of this land and there was an agreement that we would share the resources you know in a way that 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 was you know in respect of the original spirit and intent of those signatories and all the other treaties represent that as well so i guess my short answer to the let's get natives elected in parliament thing is um great you know like i love romeo great guy you know i'm, I'm proud of him uh, you know i was proud of tina keeper when she got elected to parliament you know kudos to her but there's a whole piece in there about assimilation about colonialism, about disrespecting the original spirit and intent of the treaties, of the Turo Wampum, of the fiduciary and legal obligation of the settler colonial state of Canada and knowing their place in our lands. And so I don't stand around trying to tell people like, yeah, we need a native prime minister or native MP because no, I mean, because like, he, he or she is working in the colonial house. If we don't address the root problem, which is the economic system, which is fundamentally tied into the dispossession of native people for people to have wealth in this country, okay, then it doesn't matter native or not, whoever's in the parliament is going to be subject and subservient to that agenda, okay? No matter how loud they get, all right? And I think that it's important to understand that it's not as easy as just electing some native person to go into parliament that's going to make change. It's about the system itself, the economic system, because fundamentally wealth in this country is based on getting Indian people out of their homelands, making shit so bad on the res that they leave their land, they go to this city and keeping them down okay and not honoring the original spirit and intent of treaties okay and so we gotta you know take a step back a little bit and educate ourselves a little bit more on the history of indian and white relations in this country and the agreements that have been made and that haven't been honored that's what we need to focus on when we decide what the best solution forward is and right now and I'll conclude with this. I believe that we need solidarity among social movement sectors. We need the workers of this country to line up and unite with the indigenous peoples of this country. And we need to shut this economy down until we find justice for Tina Fontaine and all the murdered and missing indigenous women, until we seek out justice, economic justice, for the people in this country, especially the children living below the poverty line, because it's freaking ridiculous in a GA country that we have have the poverty that we have in this country you know it's absolutely disgusting that there's over 200 first nations that have to boil their water to drink you know it's disgusting that the capital commission of ottawa has seven million dollars to build fucking houses on the canal so people can have you know change their skates during winter they don't have two million dollars for atawapiskat for houses It's disgusting that they've spent over a billion dollars on refurbishing the House of Canada with new copper on the roof and getting the asbestos out and that we have all this homelessness in this country. It's disgusting. And we need to address the fundamental root causes of our problems if we're going to get anywhere. So thank you very much. I'll leave it at that. Thanks a lot for your time. Catch up with you forever. I want to thank you so much for your little act in Parliament.